Most of you know that for the time being, I'm doing these podcasts from my cottage in rural Quebec. Rural connectivity makes that happen, and I'm grateful. But there's rural connectivity, and then there's remote connectivity. Let me tell you the story of how the people of Quebec's vast lower north shore, a region of small towns and villages across a 400-kilometer stretch, are getting the digital connectivity they need. It's an ambitious project from our presenting sponsor, TELUS, working hand-in-hand with the federal and Quebec governments. This is a region of Canada with no roads to speak of. Consider that for a moment. How do you get the tons of equipment and supplies for the build into the area? Helicopter and boat. And then TELUS ground teams borrow from the traditions of the locals by using all-terrain vehicles and snowmobiles to get it all where it needs to go. The work is now just about complete, a year ahead of schedule. The result is high-speed internet on par with our biggest cities and complete cell coverage. So you could say the first real access road in the region is a digital one. And it gives the people of places like Gros Mekatina and Pakwashipu far better educational opportunities, business tools, advanced medical care, and emergency services. Life-changing. Connecting Quebec's North Shore and more projects like it are part of TELUS's ongoing work to bridge digital divides so that all Canadians are connected to the technology and resources we need to thrive. You can learn more about it by going to connectingcanadaforgood.ca. All right, just before we get to today's pod, I want to give you Hurley Burleyites a heads up about a brand new video first podcast we've been working on here at Air Quotes Media Worldwide Headquarters. It's called Hurley Burley Through the Looking Glass, presented by TELUS. And it's not the Hurley Burley you're used to. I'm not interviewing political figures or journalists. Scott and Jenny won't be joining me to swear up a storm. I'm taking viewers through the looking glass of a focus group boardroom, all done virtually, of course, and into the minds of four groups of your fellow Canadians, one black, one white, one indigenous, and one Asian. It's a multi-episode exploration of the issue of race in Canada. Our political and media class often likes to rally around the notion that diversity is our strength in this country, but how strong are we really? I'm your focus group moderator for what is a fragile and emotional exploration of a deeply complicated conversation with everyday Canadians from one coast to the other. We shot the thing just a couple of weeks ago. We're editing the show right now, and we'll have it ready for you by the end of October. More details to come in a couple of weeks, and I hope you tune in. All right, curious and passionate Hurley Burley, it's time for today's two-part pod. It's a great one, and I'll tell you why. For part one, we're welcoming back two guests whose first go-round with us happens to be the number two most downloaded episode in the long, dubious history of the Hurley Burley podcast. Keith Bogue and Neil McDonald are here. Both of these stellar CBC alumni spent years working in the U.S., observing and reporting on the condition of American democracy and political discourse. We're two weeks away from Election Day. Most polls look bad for President. I won't commit to a peaceful transfer of power. What the hell is going to happen on November 3rd and in the weeks following? When will we know who won the damn thing? What is the future of the Republican Party and where do Trump voters go from here? For part two, we'll bring on our political panel, Jenny Byrne and Scott Reed. They've been agreeing so much lately, I don't even know who's who anymore. Actually, that's not true at all. If you watched on YouTube last week, you saw two separate Zoom boxes almost come to blows. We'll pick up a little bit on the U.S. election stuff, plus we'll chat about The Conservatives and the NDP both want special house committees. The Conservatives want an anti-corruption committee aimed at the Liberals. And we'll see if they'll risk an election to get one. The NDP wants some accountability around government and pandemic spending, but we're not sure what. Aaron O'Toole is criticizing Doug for not being more like Jason. How entertaining is that? And speaking of Jason, the United Conservative Party in Alberta just endorsed a resolution in favor of two-tier health care. We'll also get into Twitter, the radical left-leaning Twitter populated by Liberal Democrats. First of all, though, Neil McDonald and Keith Bogue, thrilled to have you back on the Hurley Burley today. Even more thrilled to be back, David. Thanks for inviting me. I appreciate the invitation. I'm not not sure I like being used as part of a cynical audience grab, but I went along with it anyway. (laughs) Well, you, you know, that we need ratings boosters and we come to the big hitters to get it. So thank you, gentlemen. The last time we did this... Last time we did this, we were together 
all in the same room chatting, and then we all went off for a lovely lunch together. Life has gone to shit since we last did this. Keith, how has it particularly <laughs> gone to shit for you? Well, I, I guess the most important way is, you know, I'm separated from my wife and family in, in the United States. Um, but, you know, I have to, I can't really complain too much more than that, which is, although that's fairly important to me. Um, I'm pretty well insulated uh, from the travails most people have to endure going through this. I'm retired now. Everything that I need uh, is very close to me. And uh, that means the, you know, the stores that I need to go to are open. I very, very seldom have to line up. But I think the way it's, it's impacted me more, most is probably that I have a greater realization of how lucky I am because of those things. And I know that most people don't enjoy the same comfort through this uh, difficult time as I have. I can only imagine what it's like for them, but I think that imagination has been made you know, more, more vivid just by, by knowing that I can choose the time when I go to the grocery store, I can choose the time when I go to the gas station, or I don't have to go at all if I don't want to. I think those are freedoms that most people are missing that I'm not. Yeah, you're Jeez. right. I, I, I hate that. going after Neil, somebody been? who's been... I hate going after somebody who's being humble and self-effacing. Okay, me too. Which, which, which I, I, must I feel happen lucky. to you almost <laughs> all the time. Right? <laughs> uh, yeah, look, I mean, I got a backyard, and, and that's a big deal. I mean, I, I'm like, you know, the adult kids are home like a lot of other boomers. Um, and, you know, my wife, it's, it's, it's a bit crowded, but <clears throat> I know that eventually my wife and I are going to say that we're happy they came back for this time. We've got a backyard. <clears throat> Most people, <clears throat> I can't imagine trying to do this in a small apartment, uh, which a lot of people are doing. I've got a, a backyard I can go into, so same. But, you know, I, I, I can't help feeling like I, I, I went out west on business uh, in June, and it was fine. And I felt pretty safe on the plane, and I felt pretty safe in the hotel. And I, I tried to talk uh, Joyce, my wife, into, into going, to, uh, going to Europe, going to Spain. Um, I, you know, figure we can, we can fly there, and we can get off the plane, and we can be alone in the car, and then <clears throat> we'll go to the apartment, we'll be alone in the apartment. But, <clears throat> I mean, the, the, there's a fundamental difference here. She, I, I'm willing to take a little bit of a chance. She's willing to take no chances at all. You know, uh, and she says, why would we do that uh, if we don't have to do it? I suppose there's merit in that. But, I'm, you know, if this is still like this a year from now, I, I don't, it'll be hard to take that view. Be interesting to see what will change in our perspectives if it's like this a year from now. Well, it's already changed, hasn't it? I mean, the, the Ireland just did a full lockdown. <clears throat> I can't imagine politicians being permitted by voters in Canada to do another full lockdown unless, unless you know, the morgues are, are overflowing and, and the hospitals are jammed. Uh, people are, are just not willing to, I mean, pandemic fatigue, right? So, um, yeah. Do you think we're getting immune to the For sure. case counts and death counts? Yeah, like frogs in boiling water, right? I mean, it's the same with anything. Uh, you know, you get used to something and then you get impatient. Uh, I paid attention to them, you know, at maybe even hourly <laughs> at the beginning yeah. of this. Now I don't yeah. look at the, the statistics for days on end. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah. obviously some of that's presented to you constantly on television if you watch cable news the way that, that I, I normally do. But um, the difference is that I'm not out seeking that information anymore. I have built it into my life. And uh, I expect I'll hear when somebody tells me there's been a significant change one way or the other. Although I remember in <clears throat> the end of June, the number of active COVID cases in Ottawa was 32, and I was pretty happy about that. None at all in Vancouver Island, and now it's a thousand or something in that vicinity. Yeah. Uh, so I, I do kind of check into that from time to time, and I must admit, I I I, <laughs> I can't help hitting the New York Times total and looking at it in the states today. It's 220,000 dead. Uh, it's just I mean, and that was the that that was a. a that was a predicted total several months ago. People were, were saying, no, that's not going to happen. So I, I, still, I still tune in. But, yeah, you know, you get, uh, you get numb. So you guys, you're back in Canada now. Do you pay any attention to Canadian politics at all? Or are you just focused completely on the U.S.? Is there anything about Canadian politics that interests you right now? Well, I mean, I was interested in the Conservative Party's leadership for a little while. 
Uh, I'm interested uh, to some degree in how Canada is handling the COVID crisis. But just as I did for the last four years, this year has been another year when I am just totally consumed by the American story. I, I, uh, I can't take my eyes off it, but I think also I believe it is the most important story in the world right now and that we should pay attention to it. And um, occasionally, you know, I'll run into people who disagree with that and the things they think are more important turn out to be largely also affected by what happens in the United States with, <laughs> with the coming election. So I feel pretty secure in that view. This is something that the, the, the modern world has never seen. Um, the United States abdicate from leadership in the way that it has since Donald Trump became president. And the uncertainty about what the future of the United States is, or even what its present is, there's a great deal of uncertainty about what its present is, what's really happening there. Um, it's a great story. I read about it all the time. I watch it on television. I think about it all the time. Yeah, I had a, <clears throat> I had a cameraman one time who showed up at a, in Haiti. Uh, we were down in Haiti for one of the convulsions of violence down there. And he showed up at a news conference by an American official wearing a T-shirt that said, same shit, different day, which is how cameramen and camera women tend to look at the world, right? They've just got to keep rolling. But I, I take that view with respect to Canadian politics. I mean, I, I, you know, it's, it's, I know it's cliche to say that everything's been written and it all happens again, but I, I actually see that happening now. And I've been, I was in the business for 43 years or so. Except for the states, I've never seen anything like this. Nobody's ever seen anything like this. Keith is right. It's it's you can't tear your eyes away from it. Uh, it it I, I, I've never seen anything in the Western world like what's happening in the states. Uh, and may, I, I tend to look at at stories a little bit differently from a lot of people. It's not the matter of the news repeating itself. It's the matter. It's a matter of the discourse has gone so completely off the rails that it's, you stare at it thinking, can it get any worse? And then it does. Um, there, was a, uh, there was a journalism prof the other day, Jay Rosen in the States, I like reading his stuff. And he talked about how, he talked about the, the concept of flooding the zone with shit, uh, as he puts it, the, the fire hose of falsehood. And that's what, what Trump has done. And he, he and some of his Twitter followers were talking about how there's no way to counter that. There's no way to cope with that. Uh, it, 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 it hornswoggles your political opponents. There's no way to stop it. Uh, uh, Fact-checking doesn't work. Uh, and it also confounds the media. I mean, my former colleagues um, are, are clearly in a conundrum about how to do with it, deal with it and have been for years. Um, look, just calling Trump a liar. Keith, could you imagine still being at CBC in the States and suggesting to the news desk that we just basically call what he said a lie if it's a demonstrable lie? They wouldn't let you do it. Well, it I'm not sure they wouldn't, um, and we can argue about that. I just want to, and this is not solely for the purpose of correcting Neil, but that quote about, uh, that from Jay Rosen is actually quoting Steve Bannon. And I point that out because it's Steve Bannon, you know, at one yeah, time yeah. Trump's campaign manager, who said, uh, who talked about the advantages of flooding the zone with shit, right? Yeah. Which, which I think is important because it shows a consciousness of what they're doing, a consciousness of guilt, if you'd like, um, that they understand what the attention span of the media is, how the media treats stories and how to overcome it. And I think this is what people mean when they say, the, to the extent that there's anything brilliant about Trump at all, that he understood how to hack the media. Uh, boy, did he ever. He understood what the media's incentives are uh, and really how um, to undermine uh, basic principles of, of, of reporting and coverage about balance and fairness and so on, um, simply in his behavior. And it's worked tremendously well for him. And look at where we are now in the, in the United States. You have a country that, uh, you know, it's often said that they live in two different realities, which is untrue. There is only one reality. The other side chooses to ignore it and to live in a world of fantasy. But that's a creation of this kind of flood the zone with facts. It's a byproduct of that. Um, when you have Trump constantly knowing that he can keep the red light of the camera on and it pointed at him just by uh, being outrageous every day, if that's what it takes. And he's happy to do that. He's delighted to do that. The most important we, aspect uh, of that is understanding understanding what the media will re respond to and understanding what they want. Um, I had a, a friend who worked in Kim Campbell's short-lived PMO, and she said she worked there long enough to understand how docile and how easily led most reporters are, 
And I think her expression was, we could, we could make nice warm mittens out of most of you, you're such sheep. Um, and if you understand how the media competes and what they'll go for and, and the news cycle and various basic things like that, you're right. I mean, he understood how to keep the red light on. And, he, and I think more important, he understood the insecurities and the weaknesses uh, and fragilities of the media and exploited them mightily. And it worked. Uh, and it'll probably stand, as, you know, as a as a set piece course in communications by guys like Scott Reed and David Hurley for for decades. Well, certainly we've never seen anything like it. And the flood the zone with shit strategy is one that nobody had ever thought of before. It's high risk strategy, but it seems to have worked. Well, it's out a riff. It, that was itself a riff on the New York Times' uh, strategy of flooding the zone. Jason Blair, the disgraced reporter who had to resign from making stuff up, was part of the flood the zone strategy. A story happens, send in all your best people everywhere, you know, uh, overdo everything, and, and then pick uh, amongst the product for the best stuff. Uh, and let me ask you guys about the that. media. Let me ask you guys about the media because it's an interesting thing that's happened from my perspective, and I don't really like it, which is, okay, so... You have to say the truth about Trump. You should call him a liar when he lies, which is every day. You should call him on everything. But when I watch CNN and MSNBC, it's not like Fox is an alternative reality and MSNBC and CNN are the truth. They're the other side of the story. They've taken the other side of the story, and they are opponents of Trump's and advocates of Biden's. And... Um, I learned that for, like it was very graphic to me when I watched the Biden town hall, uh, not the most recent one, but the one previous to that. And I thought he had performed awfully. And then I turned on MSNBC and CNN and I found out that he'd been flawless and he'd been tremendous. And I thought, you guys aren't reporting the news. Well, OK, first of all, I, I, I don't really buy that. Um, what is the let's say MSNBC, what is the MSNBC uh, equivalent of the Seth Rich conspiracy theory yeah. Uh, yeah. About, about the murder of a young man in Washington, D.C. Um, by what police, says, uh, police say is, was a, um, you know, a common criminal, of, uh, it, it was a robbery in progress. That's what their police report says. But in the hands of Fox News, uh, it became the insider who leaked the emails um, from the DNC uh, for some personal revenge that he wanted to exact on other Democrats and that it had nothing to do with Russia at all. And they went with this story and, and Sean Hannity in particular, without any consideration for Seth Rich's family um, and the loss that they had suffered, simply to, to distract from the Russia investigation into Donald Trump and to provide an alternate made up theory uh, as to the crime. That's not happening on MSNBC. And yes, MSNBC has a political bias, and it's very, very clear about it. And sometimes they are self-critical, but they aren't doing that shit. They aren't making stuff yeah. up. And when I they have you. a story that's juicy, yeah, yeah. when they have a story that's juicy and that harms Trump, they'll go with it up until the point they find out that it is wrong, and then they will drop it. Fox will continue going after stories that are wrong long after they've been debunked. They're still doing it. They are still doing right. it. That's what I mean. And I think that is, uh, I, we're going to get to this, or maybe we're there now. That is one of the most serious problems facing um, the United States right now, how to deal with that. And I mentioned the Seth Rich thing because it's the one that affects, not affects me, but that touches me most deeply because I can imagine how that family feels being used by a tool. That is far from the only conspiracy theory that uh, Fox News is, is uh, peddling. Look, for instance, at their treatment of the COVID crisis versus anybody else, anybody else. Uh, it, it, you know, on the right, the COVID crisis is treated like a hoax until they got the signal from the president to take it seriously. Right. Anyway, I don't, I don't want to monopolize this, but I yeah, no. yeah. Yeah, they're, they're a bit I feel like a little they're... deeply about this. They're, they're a bit like the old Communist Party Marxist-Leninist, uh, you know, several decades ago that took all its cues from Russia. There is no analogy in the mainstream media to Fox News. That's absolutely true. Look, just one simple fact. No MSNBC host or no host from anywhere, no media figure from anywhere in the, the, the regular media 
has gotten up on stage and held his arm up in <clears throat> victory with Joe Biden. Sean Hannity got up on stage for, for, for Donald Trump. Um, but, you know... It, well, wait, it, stop, Neil. Stop, Neil. Is anybody yeah. in any oh. doubt... Is anybody in any doubt about who CNN thinks should win the election? No. Well, as... as I, okay, that I, I understand what you're saying. And it's tempting to look at it that way. I think that CNN is, as, as human beings, perhaps those reporters, you know, ever, biases leak into all stories, might, might hope that the national nightmare uh, ends uh, in, in two weeks. Uh, but I'll tell you this, I know a number of American reporters. And if, they, uh, if, if there are reporters at MSNBC and at NBC and at CNN, and at the New York Times, who, if they got a scoop that was damaging to Joe Biden, would verify it and go with it. Um, well, we saw that in 2016. You know, Hillary Clinton's emails over yeah. and over yeah. and over and over again in the New York Times. You know, at yeah. the time, the yeah. most respected pillar of American journalism, on, or at least on the left, but I would say in mainstream America. Uh, this, I think, is how Trump has hacked the media. The New York Times was, uh, was trying to adhere to a standard of balance and fairness in journalism that does not apply in an asymmetric campaign. You cannot continue to look at all of the, the, no. uh, the things that, that Trump could be accused of, even in 2016, uh, you know, from, from not just his contacts with Russia and so on, which have been, you know, litigated to death and so on, but just like his business practices, the things he said on, on, uh, on, on the stump, the insults, the lies, all of that stuff, and every time come back and say, yeah, but Hillary's emails. But that's what Trump did. He knew the media would search for some place to find a balance so that they could, they could, um, they could adhere to a, a standard of objectivity that was phony to begin with and did not stand up to an asymmetric campaign where one side's um, offenses in terms of the normal way of thinking about politics in America and decency, uh, all of those offenses amounted to a skyscraper's high uh, catalog. And then on the other side, you didn't really have very much to go against it except emails. So just go after emails again and again and again and again and again and look what happened. Yeah, it's a bit like the way, it's a bit like Canada dealing with China. You know, they, we put Ming, uh, I can't pronounce her entire name, they, they, the, um, the woman that's un under house arrest in BC, under house arrest, and the Chinese lock up the two Michaels and deny them con dipular, or consular contact. And, you know, people want to say, well, we should treat her the same way, but we can't because we've got a system of justice and, the Amer and, and mainstream media in America can't because they've got journalistic ethics. Um, but, you know, it's, it's the, 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 they tried, um, uh, or they, you remember Dean Baquet? Is that how you pronounce his name, Baquet? The executive editor of the New York Times back uh, in 2016 authorized the first use of calling Trump a lie, a lie in a headline. They actually did that on page one. And there was, they, they interviewed Baquet and he said, well, we just decided that we had to do it because he lied, demonstrably he lied. Uh, and he, he used the birther stuff as an example. I mean, he, he repeatedly told a lie that he knew was a lie and kept telling it after it was revealed to be a lie, and that's a lie. Yes, it's true. And yet, to this day, uh, most mainstream media organizations prefer to use um, evident falsehoods or uh, assertions ungrounded in truth or you know, various other euphemisms because it's just difficult to bring yourself to call a head of authority a liar. Uh, at CBC, you would have gotten fired for it. I That's was, not I true. We actually, we actually did call, we say something Stephen Harper said was a lie. And it had to do with, the, you remember in 2008, the, the whole crisis around the coalition and so on. And, yeah. and Stephen Harper repeatedly characterized and baldly stated that the Bloc Québécois was a part of the coalition when it was not. Right. And it was clearly important that, that to Stephen Harper that the voting public believe that it, it was a part of the coalition, even though on the basis of the evidence and the signatures on the documents, uh, that created the coalition, it was absolutely false. So we said so. We said Stephen Parker told a lie. We put it in the intro. Ooh. So let's get some context here for what's going on in the States. Let's get some context. So I'm sure that most of my listeners are obsessively following polls, probably reading Nate Silver every day. 
Sometimes in the last few days, you see headlines that say the thing is tightening again in some of the states. And Trump seems to have lots of energy out there on the campaign trail. What is your feeling about what the state of the race is right now? I know that there's a lot of variables that could happen in the next two weeks, so I'm not asking you to call it. But if it was today, what do you think would happen? Well, I think, you know, I, I, I have a lot of confidence in, in Nate Silver in 538. Um, I know people think they got it wrong in 2016, and I don't believe they did get it wrong in 2016. I think people don't understand basic probabilities, that they don't understand that when Trump has a 20, I think he had a 29% chance of winning 2016. That is literally what the probability says. You don't round it down to zero and say Hillary Clinton's going to win. What that means is that if you run the election 100 times, he's going to win it 29 times. And you don't know which one that is, but if he doesn't win it 29 times, then your, your probability forecast is as wrong as if um, Hillary Clinton didn't win it 71 times. So, like, first of all, uh, that's why I have confidence in, in the data that I'm about to cite, which is that, that at this point, two weeks out, uh, according to 538, Trump has about a 12% chance of winning, a 12 and 100 chance of winning, and Biden has 87 or 88 uh, chances of winning out of 100. That's pretty significant. There's not a lot of time left to change that uh, in, uh, before voting day. And in fact, so many people have voted now already either through mail-in ballots or by voting early at the polls, that it's harder than it probably ever has been in any election to change the vote in the last two weeks because so much of it is locked in. So I think that we don't want to overlearn the lesson of 2016. We all feel somewhat bruised uh, by being overconfident in Hillary Clinton's success. Maybe not all of us. Some out there will say, I told you so, and I don't know what they base their projections on because it certainly couldn't have been data. Um, but look, I think that you do yourself harm in, in being overly cautious about this in the sense that unless you understand that Nate Silver's uh, projection of an 87% chance of winning for Biden is true, you're not going to understand why Donald Trump is doing and saying the things that he says on the campaign today. And I think it's important to understand that Donald Trump is looking at the same data we are. He says he isn't. He says he's got polls that show them way, way ahead. And that's just not true. Yeah. Uh, but you see, you see in his behavior that he's asking, he's not act, he is not acting in any way like somebody who's way ahead in the polls. Come on. So. If I don't win this state, I'm never coming yeah. back. Yeah. Yeah. What, 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 I, I, who, who dreamed that one up? I, I mean, yeah. I, I mean, honestly. I came said, up with that line. I have said for, for since 2017, uh, it really began with the Women's March the day after inauguration, but uh, in an evidence-based world, let's say it began in, with the Virginia election, which Democrats uh, performed uh, unbelievably well in, in 2017. I have said since then that, that Donald Trump motivates both bases, but he motivates Democrats more. And I think that, that the evidence is showing that with the early voting, just the tremendous enthusiasm. People yeah, talk the about early voting. early voting. Yeah, people talk about how the, oh, people don't have enthusiasm for voting uh, for Biden. Maybe that's true, maybe that isn't. What the lesson should be, though, is they have tremendous enthusiasm for voting against for voting Donald against Trump. Trump. And negative partisanship is one of the defining factors of modern politics, uh, particularly in the United States, but I, I suspect in, uh, to a degree in Canada as well now. Neil, what's your I take love on where seeing things that, are at? I, I love seeing that early voting uh, because it is in part a reaction to voter suppression. Donald Trump and the Republicans have tried every means they could dream up to suppress vote in heavily uh, Democratic areas, especially amongst black Americans. And the result has been people flooding in to do early voting, which is not what Trump wanted at all. And you'll notice that he has kind of laid off talking about the massive uh, mail-in fraud and the massive fraud and how he isn't going to recognize the results. Because I, somebody has probably told him that the more you talk about that, the more people go out and do early voting. Uh, but I, I take Keith's point on, on the data uh, and, the, and the 29% and the 29 times out of 100. But, you know, I remember on election night, last, last election, 
I was in Toronto on the radio news special that CBC did. And we remember the New York Times had that needle. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if they still have it, but they had this needle. And yeah. I think Hillary started the night out at... Best innovation in election coverage, so, but it broke my fucking heart that night, that Oh, needle. man. Yeah, if, I know. If, if, you have a, if you have a weak heart, heart stay yeah. away from that. <laughs> They also they, have, they actually have two needles, don't they? They have like the regular one, which I watch, and then the jittery one, which re- re- reacts to every little change. And that's the one my heart could not possibly stand. <laughs> so I was watching. I was watching the stable needle, and I remember sitting there as Michael Enright was talking about how Hillary's probably going to win, and watching that needle sink, and thinking, "Oh my Christ!" Uh, and and because of that, and because of I, I mean, I felt that. Nate Silver could have done better uh, last time around. I, I don't. Uh, I, I don't see how. I really yeah, okay. do not see how. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, okay. It, let, it, I mean, we talk about Nate Silver, uh, and I guess to some extent he he is the standard out there. The guy yeah. who got it wrong was Sam Wang. Sam Wang was getting a lot of currency online, uh, and, and people would, you know, if I quoted um, Nate Silver in a piece, which I. I did from time to time. Oh, I yeah. really should be listening to Sam Wang yeah. at Princeton University and the election consortium there. They've got a much better model. Sam Wang was saying that Hillary Clinton's chances of winning were 99%, and the only reason they weren't 100 is because that wouldn't his, his probability model wouldn't accept that. He was accusing Nate Silver of ginning up a race because he wanted the clicks. Um, like, the, like That's how nasty it got out there amongst the forecasters. I recently did a search to see how many people really went after Nate Silver for being too bullish on Donald Trump. And it's out there. Huffington Post was after him for that. Um, yeah. uh, there's another one I can't remember exactly right now. But re- they were after him for being too pro-Trump in his, his probability forecast. Uh, that's the environment. And you'll see if you'll pay attention to him on a daily basis like I do almost every day now, that in the last few days he's been resurrecting these things and saying, come on, you know, here's what I did. Um, Here's what everybody else did. Here's what they said I was doing. Here's what I was actually doing. Tell me that I'm wrong. Uh, you know, like let's let's remember that Hillary Clinton won the popular vote and hel- and, and yep. lost the electoral college. That yep, has been yep. done only had been done only four times before in U.S. politics. The chances of that happening uh, were were nine percent. Okay, so what was the correct forecast for Trump winning uh, the electoral college and not winning the? Um, the uh, popular vote when he was trailing the popular vote by between two and three percentage points. No, look, I don't I think it your, was I, even I, as I, high as, as, as Nate I, Silver. I take, your, I take your point and all so that. You should not like, have opened like, this rabbit hole. I'm, okay, okay. I'm embarrassed but, now that I just can win John about all of this. <laughs> no, you're right. Listen, I think you're right. But like most people, I internalized the, the idea That's that why we have editors. There, was over, there was an overwhelming, <laughs> there was an overwhelming <laughs> chance that Hillary was going to win. And I remember sitting watching that needle sink. And you know, I, I've noticed a, that a lot of my friends have tried to sort of mentally inoculate themselves against a Trump win by saying, well, I still think Trump's going to win, hoping that, you know, that, that he won't, right? Uh, I, I find myself kind of doing the same thing. You know, I'll, I, I will read... The, the cover, I'll, I'll, you, you watch Trump, he's behaving like a loser, he's talking about leaving the country, he's talking about getting on a plane and never coming back, all of which is wonderful to watch. But, you know, at the ba- in the back of my mind, there is the attitude I had going into 2016 and how cocky I was when I got on the plane to go down to Toronto. I thought I was going to sit there and be able to snark all night about how this idiot lost. And, you know, I fear it happening again. <laughs> frankly. So uh, no, but you, I mean, asked how, a- you asked how I feel. That's how I feel. I don't know how, how it's anecdotal and I don't know how I, whether how I feel matters, but I, and I think a lot of people probably feel that way. But not- from a rational point of view, if you're Neil McDonald, you know, you would much rather say that Trump is going to win and be wrong than to say Biden's going to win and be wrong. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, you're, I, I don't, I don't think that, that your emotions are in any way out of line with 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 your experience or, and your you've understanding never, of the reality. Never, it's just it's just a much more comfortable thing for the day after election day to be disappointed that that uh, you were wrong about Trump winning than the other Keith, way around. Keith has never had any respect for my emotions. <laughs> I don't even know what that's supposed to mean. <laughs> um, anyway, he, uh, Keith has always been a little more. I, I've always been a little more emotional in my Jesus. 
I can't believe I'm talking like this. I, Keith has, has always been a little more analytical in his approach than I have. I'll, I, I always I've that. been more analytical in my, uh, my analysis. Yeah. I was, I'm being nice. <laughs> Anyway, David, look, I feel like like I, we kind of hijacked this. Yeah. He's something on the table and, and blah, 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 blah. We can't shut <laughs> up about it. He's being humble and self-effacing again. Yeah. Well, it's my nature. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Is Trump's closing argument as incoherent as it looks um, in terms of flailing, attacking Fauci, uh, attacking Biden for saying he would listen to Fauci, this stuff about ple like begging suburban women uh, to identify as suburban women and to overcome their hatred for him because he saved their neighborhoods. Um, it, it's it, it's like it looks like wild desperation, crazy shit. But it looked to me like that in 2016 too. Although no, there was a core of a message there about the economy and about culture that I could understand that I don't see now. So well, I guess what I'm asking is: is there something to this message? That is going to resonate with people that I'm not that I don't understand, or is this has he gone off into just crazy town? Well, I mean, don't forget you're talking about the guy who stood at a podium four years ago and yelled, "I love uneducated people." Uh, maybe he has he uh, clearly he has an instinct on how to appeal to the flying monkeys in the base in a way that the rest of us can't. He tells them what they want to hear, which is a very powerful thing to do with human beings. Um, and uh, don't forget, these are people that, I, re I remember I was down in the States when, Ogden, I know anecdotes, but I was down in, in Ogdensburg where I have a little postal box where I can go down and get American stuff. Uh, don't have that anymore. But there were, there were a couple of guys, uh, you know, working class guys, Trump fans, arguing about Trump and, and the mainstream media. And they, they, Somehow they drew me into it. They saw me looking at them, and one of them sort of said, what do you think? And I said, well, except he is a liar, and he did have an affair with Stormy Daniels, and he did pay off a porn star. And they looked at each other, and the guy goes, yeah, so what? I would have too, right? So you know, that, that doesn't compute with me. <laughs> you, you, that, I, I, but Trump clearly knows how to appeal to that sensibility. And as a journalist, you're trained not to appeal to that sensibility. So I, I, I confess that perhaps I'm incapable of seeing the genius if, if, it is the, if it is indeed there. But, you know, he pulled it off last time. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm self-inoculating here, but maybe there's something to it. As a rational person, you wouldn't think so, but, you know, he's not, he is not appealing to rational people. Well, I think isn't one of the remarkable things about the past four years, how stable Trump support has been. Um, but it's been, stable, it, it's been stable at a uh, historically low level. No president in his first term has gone through the entire thing without ever once uh, having uh, an average at 50% or better. Uh, Trump is unique in that regard. And he's pretty much maybe a tiny bit lower than where he has been. His, but remarkably, his approval rating and his rating in the popular vote, according polling averages, is roughly the same. Uh, right now, I believe, and, and I mean that that in in a sense, I guess whether he has a closing argument is almost irrelevant when you have that kind of stability in the polls. Yeah, and the thing, the frustration that that he's feeling right now is what he's been warned about probably every single day by somebody sensible around him. If there is somebody sensible around him, that you have to grow your base, Donald. You can't do this again. You know, you can't just rely on turnout to get you, uh, you know, over the finish line this time. You're not running against Hillary Clinton again. That's a hugely important factor, yeah, by yeah. the way. Yeah. Um, that is working against him. Joe Biden's not Hillary Clinton. And more important, perhaps. In the sense that he's inferior to her in every respect except for being a man. Precisely. Precisely. I, I when he opens know. his mouth, he's, different. he's not Hillary Clinton in the sense that Hillary Clinton is superior to Joe Biden in every respect, except that she's a woman and he's a man, right? That is correct. I don't yeah, know I, if that's correct. I, I wince when I listen. When he opens his mouth, I wince. I try to watch those debates, and when he, I, he's just sort of, oh my god! But he's what he is the he's what they've got. You know, right. look, 
I, I'm not denying that there isn't an element of, of sexism or misogyny or whatever you call it in, in Hillary Clinton's defeat, but there are important differences other than that between Clinton, uh, Hillary and, uh, Clinton and Joe Biden. And the most marked is, I think, that, that what we overlook, we kind of media elites and so on, is that Biden demonstrably has a rapport with those voters who feel alienated from the system that Hillary Clinton could not connect with, right? And it, that is why Trump, I think, identified yeah. him as his opponent so early on, most feared him as an opponent, because Biden had something that Clinton didn't have beyond being just a, a man. He had an ability to talk to those people as though he were one of them, as though he understood what their issues were, what their fears were, and what their hopes were. Uh, and whether you like him at a certain level or respect him at a certain level in a pol policy wonk way or think he has a vision, and all of those I think are legitimate um, uh, criticisms, I think it's also undeniable that he has something that people like us are probably incapable of understanding. And that's a rapport with people who feel that they've been left out. The people well, that Donald um, Trump also appeals to. Well, you know, I mean, in, this whole elitism thing is fascinating because, you know, I've... I've uh, you know, uh, the idea that a Manhattan billionaire, if indeed he is a billionaire, is the champion of the underdog and, and not elite is ridiculous. But Biden actually is not elite. I mean, he, except for the fact that he... No, I would certainly agree with that. You know, uh, except for the fact that he lived at the National... Remember David Axelrod's story about Barack Obama convening his first cabinet meeting and pointing out that the only person... Joe was the only guy at the table that actually needed the salary. Right, I mean, he's he was what he was the poorest member of Congress. He was never a wealthy man. The Joe from Scranton stuff, yeah, it works. He had but a I'm mortgage. Trying, what, yeah, he had a mortgage. I'm saying, and and most members of Congress who arrive not a millionaire are a multimillionaire by the time their term is up. <coughs> but you know, nonetheless, he he, you've got to feel this. He opens his mouth at those debates and starts the stream of consciousness stuff, and it just, I I I have to look away. Um, and as for those, those, the, 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 I remember during the, the women's march, I was down in Washington for that, and uh, Joyce, my wife, was said with some derision, you know, these are people who were, you know, a week ago saying they just couldn't bring themselves to vote for Hillary because she was so polarizing. Well, now look what they've got. But I mean, we're getting a field here. The, que the question I think was. Uh, is there any way he can pull this off, or what about his closing argument? And uh, it, it, it's, it's almost like a divining ceremony, trying to figure out what works down there and what doesn't. And are you saying, Keith, that you don't think that there's any chance that he'll win, that he'll pull it off again? Look, I think you that think the probability there's a 19 percent chance. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I think it's nine percent, or no, I think it's twelve percent now. I'm yeah. saying that, it, yeah, no, I, I'm saying that it's, it's. Very, very difficult. If if you accept that he has a poss possibility of winning, um, because he has a probability of twelve percent, then you're accepting that it ha that he has a path to two hundred seventy electoral votes. What I'm saying is that path is very, very narrow, and it's hard to see how he accomplishes it. It's really very, very difficult, and it's more difficult than it was in 2016. Well, so there's, the, look, there's also there's the electoral college. Uh, which well, that's what think, I'm talking about. I'm yeah, talking most about people don't the electorate. Yeah, most people don't so understand let me that. Present you, let me present oh. you guys with a scenario. Listen to let us. Listen, listen to us for a second. We're, we're, we, we have all decided, we, we, we all agree that the President of the United States is a horrible, dreadful human being and it'll be a disaster if he wins. Can you imagine us all agreeing on that on any previous president? I mean, he, he, just the lack of decency of the man, right? W? It, it didn't... Well, no. W? Well, I, no. I mean, George W. Bush had policies you might disagree with and, and you know, tearing apart yeah, a country. Yeah, I did disagree and, with them, yeah. Sure. Yeah, me too. But he, the, the basic norms of decency, I, I think I, I, that— look, I, I understand well, what is, you're saying, is the, Neil. Is the, is the Iraq war okay if you observe basic <laughs> norms of decency? And you're right. And, you know, Trump didn't invade and tear apart another country and cause hundreds of thousands of deaths. The, the neocons did. But still, you know, as a matter of punditry or as a matter of being pr uh, professional uh, observers of politics, we wouldn't have dreamed up until now of just openly saying, look, one of them is, a, is something akin to a, a bloody monstrosity and shouldn't win. You know, right. and that's what's different about him. 
So here's my scenario for you guys, because I think about this a lot. <clears throat> the data shows that Democrats are much more likely to vote uh, through a mail-in ballot than are Republicans. The Republicans are much more likely to vote in person. Trump has, for many Americans in many parts of the country, mail-in ballots are a relatively new phenomenon. In some parts of the country, like California, it's well-established, but in other parts of the country, relatively new phenomenon. Americans are used to knowing who the president is or how, or with much likelihood who the president is on election night. Trump has gone to great lengths to invalidate the idea of mail-in and absentee voting and the potential for fraud in that. In the midterms, I was in California where most people vote in advance through mail-in ballots and have for a number of elections. And uh, the guy, uh, Ace Smith, who was my host down there, was running the campaign of a guy named Tony Thurmond, who was I'm running impressed. for a uh, school board trustee. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, school board trustee, school superintendent. Big, big race, province, uh, statewide race. And on election night, Tony was down by 250,000 votes. And over the subsequent days, as they counted the mail-in ballots, he crept ahead. By Wednesday, he was ahead. And a week later, he was declared the victor by more than a million votes. If such a scenario were to occur after the, after the presidential election, how do the 44% of bedrock Trump supporters react to that? Huh. When, when the, their, their president or their ex-president will call upon them to liberate themselves and they'll start showing up at legislatures with guns. I mean, this, these are the same people that showed up at, at Barack Obama's rallies with AR-14s on their back and carry 45 caliber pistols into Starbucks's. Um, they, they, they conspire to kid kidnap Democratic governors and hold mock trials and execute them. I mean, the, the Americans have taken individualism and shunning of social solidarity to, to extremes that ha weren't, haven't been seen in, in a century. Um, but... How new is that data on, on, um, on Democrats preferring to vote mail-in uh, as things have evolved and as Trump has, Trump who himself has voted with a mail-in ballot, by the way, as Trump has denounced it and demonized it and it has become apparent that he was going to use it as an excuse to, to denounce the results of the election, are Democrats still doing that or are they part of the people that are showing up to do early voting in person? Well, or the latest- off their ballots. Yeah, the latest- Data from yesterday shows that Democrats are, uh, it looks like a two to one margin are turning out over uh, Republicans yeah. uh, for, for voting. For good reason. For early voting. I don't know that there's a way of measuring mail in votes this, this uh, far out, but, but I think that, I mean, I think these are all very important questions that, are, um, that, that lead us to um, believe or understand that. Um, why these, I, Neil hates this word, narratives, but the narratives are going to be important. What are people's expectations of election night? And I think this is a difficult uh, challenge for the media because I see that, that like mainstream media is actually doing two opposing things at the same time right now. They're both trying to condition the public for not having an election result that's clear on election night. Uh, and wait until the mail-in ballots are counted, while at the same time saying, but you might have one that's clear if Joe Biden wins in Florida and Joe Biden wins in Pennsylvania, yeah. both states which can deliver results early, even with mail-in ballots. Um, so, you know, and I, and I think that, I think their preferred outcome is to walk this very tricky line and hope that they can say on election night, we don't know what the mail-in ballots say, but when you look at Pennsylvania tonight and you look at Florida tonight, it really is not going to be the second term of Donald Trump's administration uh, in 2021. Joe Biden looks like he's going to be the president. I think that's the narrative they're hoping for so that they can eat their cake and have it too. But I think the chance of it happening the way that, that David has outlined is both realistic and frightening, frightening in the way that Neil describes. I don't believe that there's going to be an institutional failure. There was a time when I was worried about that, but I'm, I'm calmer about that now. Um, 
in a sense, I guess, I think that what Joe Biden said a couple of weeks ago is probably the most likely thing. That is that the institutions will, yeah. will they, they, we're not going to have to leave it up to Donald Trump to decide whether he's going to leave the White House. He will leave the White House. The institutions will hold up. A new administration will be sworn in. There will be a new cabinet and so on. But in the streets where those people who have been fed a diet of, of Donald Trump's idea of reality and Fox News's idea of reality and have an inflated sense of what the purpose of arms are in a democratic uh, uh, a democracy like uh, the United States, I think that's, that's a real threat. I, don't, I, I think that could be messy and ugly and violent and... and you know, I hope it doesn't lead to serious consequences, but I, I understand that it could. But I, I'm not where I think that, that like there's going to be a coup d'etat and Donald Trump is going to be the president next year if he loses the election. No. I think it's entirely possible, though, that you'll hear a speech that will go something like this. Um, my fellow Americans, it, it's unclear. It was rigged. It was crooked. I told you this was going to happen. Uh, they rigged it. Uh, I have a duty to you and to the Constitution of the United States to stay here in the White House until we figure what the hell just happened. I can hear it. Now, you're right. Whether that will resonate, whether that will be accepted, will be a test of the integrity of the, of the, of the systems in the United States. I, I don't pretend to be uh, an expert in how those things operate, but uh, the, conf the, elect the Conference of Electors will, will meet. They'll cast their votes accordingly. There will be a president declared. And then how do the institutions have to react if the, president, if, if the current president is still refusing to accept the outcome? What institution has to react? The military, the National Guard, the police? You know, there, 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 is the, there are the tools of governance and then there are the tools of enforcement. How does it have to work? Well, the, Donald Trump will cease to become president at noon on, on uh, January 20th. And presumably the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court will refuse to swear him in, the Chief Justice mm -hmm. of the United States, John Roberts. And he will swear on somebody else, and to hell with Donald Trump. That's what I mean by the institutions will hold up against this. Right. And what happens if we have a Florida again? I know, I mean, you can imagine yeah, this. Yeah, I mean, scenarios. Like, what the, happens if the there's fear another Florida? Is, the, the fear Supreme is not, court, not another Amy Florida. It's, it, it, right. it's 10 Floridas, right? What if we have 10 yeah. Floridas mm -hmm. simultaneously going through the court system? What has and Amy me? Coney Barrett voting on the uh, deciding ultimately on the legitimacy of those results, um, you know that that truly does test the integrity of an institution because you know what happened. He put her in there saying that I'm going to have to rely on her vote. I'll tell you what happens. Democrats will do something that Republicans are incapable of doing. They will put millions and millions of people in the street. We know they can do it because they've done it. They did it the day after Trump was sworn in in 2017 with the, with the Women's March, and the marches that happened in, in, in Washington uh, were replicated around the country and around the world. Democrats can do that. Donald Trump has never been able to do that. Don't be fooled by the fact that he can get 10,000 people at a rally. People do not go out in the streets in the masses like they do uh, against him. People that do not still go doesn't speak for to how the, the question of how the institutions will operate and react in the, the event. The institution, that, what, uh, well, my point is that the institutions will react to that reality. How? So By what, doing what they're supposed to do. Let's assume there's a transfer of power and let's assume he loses. What happens to those voters? Do they just go back to voting for Jeb Bush as the Republican nominee or some mope like that? Um, that they've come to hate, or is there some smarter, better version of Donald Trump that comes along? Like, is that now a serious political force to be mobilized by somebody? Sure, I think that that that's undeniable. That the party, the party as a as an electoral uh, as a as a political machine that can get elected is in the hands of the of the um, of of the Trumpists, right? The agenda of the party in terms of, of deregulation, tax cuts, and getting rid of health care is in the hands of the elite um, Republicans and the caucus. Um, but it's pretty clear now that they have been, since before Donald Trump, beholden to a, a grassroots base um, that they can neither control nor deliver uh, an agenda to, right? Um, and that's a serious problem, but it's their problem. 
Um, right. and, they, and they're going to have to deal with it. But it's not the first time, like they've been coming to this um, election after election after election, right? You saw it beginning with the Tea Party in, in 2010. And then you saw it after the 2012 election when the party elites came up with what they called the autopsy, which was a blueprint for how the Republican Party was becoming, going to move to the center, be more moderate, and reach out to minority groups that they knew they needed to uh, have in their tent if they were going to survive as a political party. And then they, that was rejected by um, you know, the, the so-called Tea Party wing of the Republican Party. They couldn't do things like um, immigration reform. And then the next thing, that big thing that comes along is Trump. So inexorably, the power within the party has, has gone to this um, extreme movement, grassroots movement, that I think is most likely, at this moment, I think is most likely to be inherited by somebody like Donald Trump Jr. Um, than it is by somebody even like Tom Cotton. Because those people don't regard, they, they don't regard the, the elite conservative, they, they don't regard, uh, say, even Mitch McConnell as a real conservative. They regard him as a rhino. I mean, Donald Trump has succeeded in, in showing the Republican Party that lying and moral sludge and grifting can work as a strategy. And he's, he's being imitated. Did you see Purdue the other day at the rally? doing the, 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 the riff on Kamala Harris's name, Kamala, yeah. Mala, Mala, whatever. That is pure Trump. He, he was doing a Trump imitation. And there's going to be a yeah. lot of that. There will be a lot of Trump imitators show up. Um, as for the base, uh, they'll, I, they'll do, they're empowered. They will do what they did when Obama was elected. They'll retreat to Fox News. They'll, you know, they'll show up at rallies. Remember, th these are the ones that showed up at rallies with, you know, portraits of Obama as Hitler and spread crazy messages and, and you know, he's going to take away our guns. And generally, we're angry for, for, for eight years until they got Trump back. I, I assume they'll go back to that, you know, covered and, and, and led and, and, uh, and encouraged uh, by Fox News. Uh, but, you know, to, when you talk about the Republican elites, basically you're talking about Tom Frank's theory that that the traditional Republican approach is bait and switch. You promise people that you're going to address all these moral concerns, and then once you get elected, you put those aside in favor of pursuing your lopsided economic agenda, which doesn't benefit them, it benefits you, and it's always worked. It's not gonna, it, it won't work anymore with large swaths of those people. They want, they want uh, anger, they want revenge, they want, uh, they, they want somebody who will in the crudest possible terms, attack liberals, hit them over the head, mock them, make fun of them. And I'm not even sure they have particular policy uh, goals other than individual liberty, not wearing a mask, uh, you know, not taking vaccinations, that sort of thing. I'm not sure that how much base of it's pure race has how much of it's how much, how much how much of it's pure race? How much of it is the last gasp of white America? I think it, I think a that, lot. that is the story, right? When, like over a period of time, uh, well, when you I think when we look back on this period of time, you will see that over um, decades there has been a ro an erosion of the of the um, white vote in the United States and a backlash against that, um, and that everything became much more consecrated, concentrated, and intense with the election of Barack Obama. Followed by the election of Donald Trump, I think that I think that's a correct way of analyzing uh, what we have seen since 2008. It's not a coincidence, in my mind, that those things happened back to back. Um, I think the important thing about it is that it's not reversible. That this the, there is an inevit inevitability to the demographic change that's happening in America, and so. To the extent that um, this is the type of resistance we're going to see to it, I think it's ultimately going to turn out to be futile. But the the pressing question is what damage can be done to the country as it works well, its way through this. You might speculate, this. though, that people Agree. who feel that way, that white Americans who feel that their country is being taken from them, that voting for Donald Trump is not the most extreme thing they might do to stop that. No, the most extreme thing they might do is is what Christopher Ray, the FBI uh, director, fears they will do. He has named 
white supremacist violence as, as a foremost threat of terrorism uh, in the United States. But I agree with Keith on the, <clears throat> the permanence of what is happening. Um, Richard Rodriguez, who is a pretty good writer and, uh, and social observer, wrote several decades ago, wrote a book called Slouching Towards LA about the transformation of urban populations in the States. And he predicted Barack Obama. And he, he predicts eventually a, what he calls a coffee-colored population. Um, and remember how quickly the, the um, I'm skipping around here, but how quickly the opposition to gay marriage melted uh, amongst Republicans when they saw the, 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 the incredible transformation in public opinion? That was largely because of the arrival of, of millennials. Um, the same thing is going to happen with, with mixed-race America. It, will, it is inevitable, and it will be permanent. Uh, and it probably can't happen fast enough, quite frankly. It'll give people less, fewer things to, to uh, fight over. But what is going to happen in the meantime? Uh, there are people that feel extremely threatened by that. A bit like, you know, the white male guys that are running corporations are looking with great nervousness at the diversity and inclusion agenda. These people are, are looking with naked fear at the whole idea of the country being taken over by other than whites. And I think it'll be violent. And I think the, the, the authorities will struggle to contain it because historically the authorities have treated white supremacist or white violence with a much gentler glove. You know, if, if, if some, if, you know, when the cops show up and it's a white guy with a gun, chances are he's going to wind up in jail. When they show up and it's a black guy with a gun, he's going to wind up dead. Um, <clears throat> and, the large, and, and that applies in the larger sense, I think. Uh, it's going to be a scary period. It's going to be a really newsy period. It'll be a good time to be a reporter. I think, though, that, that I think these are important things um, to worry about, what, you know, what Neil is describing. But, but I also think that the, the, the other reality is that um, it's pretty clear that, that there are certain people in the political life of, of America, in the Republican Party, who are no longer heavily invested in the idea of dem democracy uh, and the vote in the way that uh, you might expect them to be in the United States or in the way they might have been in the past, although it's, it, it can be hard to find an example of when they were completely invested in, yeah, I was in say, the ballot say. box, you know, and, and you consider the civil <laughs> rights era. But look at the emphasis that Republicans are placing on the courts now, right? Because it, we're, in, we're moving quickly through this period of minoritarian government in, in, in the United States where you have a president that wasn't elected by the majority of the people. For a while, you had a House of Representatives that wasn't elected by a majority. You have a Senate that represents the minority, and now you have a court that represents a minority. And, and these are the institutions that, that I think some Republicans believe can, can preserve their hold on power, that if they can't do it at the ballot box, they can do it at the courts. And that's why the courts have become the priority that they have. And that's why, and I think Democrats understand, that the court, that, that uh, the 6-3 majority that they expect in the court isn't really there so much to overturn Roe v. Wade. Um, and, I, you know, I have very complicated, uh, not feelings, but a, a analysis of whether they really want that anyway. But what they for sure want is to be able to have the final say on election laws, as they did in, in uh, the southern states when they got rid of the import, most important features of the Voting Rights Act from 1965. And we've seen the consequence of that and how it's led to further voter suppression, and that voter suppression is always aimed at Democrats. Uh, and we've seen that how, how the Supreme Court has served the interests of business way more than it served the interests of social conservatives, really. Um, when you look at, at uh, any challenges that go to the courts, that involve the interests of corporate America, uh, corporate America always wins, 100% of the time, always wins. And I think those are the interests that the Republican Party uh, is, is, um, is preserving, that its, that its power will be invested in the court system, not the democratic system, and the court system will protect its economic uh, power in the United States. And how long can that last, I think, is the question that we're seeing now. That's what this election is about. It's endlessly Gentlemen. amusing to watch the Republican rediscover um, their, their commitment to institutions and democracy on a selective basis. I know it's a, a game that we all play, spot the hypocrisy, but the, you know, in the last couple of days, Pence and, and various Republicans have been hitting on the idea of court packing and how terrible that is and how, one, and how our, our Supreme Court needs to be protected. I mean, yeah. honestly, right? These are the same people that are... Go ahead, David. Sorry. 
No, yeah, no, I was finished. No, up. no, I, I mean, it's 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 rich. It's fun to watch. It's it doesn't make it any less venal or any less hypocritical. But there is no limit to the hypocrisy anymore. I mean, the the idea that that the the Democrats are going to um, are going to court pack uh, as though the the law doesn't allow that, <clears throat> whereas where they will say, "Watch us, we'll never appoint a judge." Uh, within a year of an election, and they're willing to do it within a week. It doesn't matter. The hypocrisy doesn't matter anymore, and it's almost a mistake for the media to be I mean, as entertaining as it is to keep pointing it out because it just doesn't matter. Because uh, hypocrisy, for hypocrisy to matter, depends on shame, and shame has disappeared. Shamelessness so, pays. In the absence of shame, hypocrisy. In the absence of, hypo of hypocrisy, shame is. In the absence of shame, hypocrisy is meaningless. Anyway, guys, gentlemen, I, 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 I can't like believe the CBC. Me. I can't believe the CBC used to hold you to ten or twenty seconds of commentary and analysis at a time. This has been absolutely fascinating. Thank Sounds you like so much for doing it, and I can't imagine <laughs> that we won't do it afterwards to uh, take a look at what kind of situation that we're in. And you can pull out all anyway. the clips from this uh, hurly burly episode and point out where we got it wrong, and it'll just. Hey, be well, that would hardly be the. That will hardly be the point. Look, thank you very much for uh, inviting me, inviting us. Um, it's great fun uh, to be on a show that I listen to and respect all the time, and it's good to see you, David. He's right. being humble He's and self-effacing again. Good to see you. And I'm being a human being, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> all right. On that note, Take we'll care, be Neil. back, ladies yeah, and gentlemen, with the panel. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so... When you've been around politics as long as I have, you acquire some institutional memory. I remember, because I was in the room, a time when liberals were cutting, not spending. It wasn't pleasant and really not on brand, but we had to do it. We were accused of attacking Canadian institutions, never more than the day Finance Minister Paul Martin announced that the government would sell the biggest and oldest crown corporation of them all. 25 years ago, the government privatized CN. It was the biggest IPO in Canadian history. The Globe and Mail snarked that economic nationalists would lash themselves to the railway tracks, singing Gordon Lightfoot songs and crying betrayal. Our national dream is on the auction block, one commentator declared on CBC. But CN was also a sinkhole for tax dollars, as investment experts and business journalists promptly reminded us. They mocked the decision to privatize and predicted disaster. CN was a crown-owned basket case. It was bloated. It consumed boxcars of subsidies. The stock it was offering would not just be a dog. It would be a dog on steroids. The pundits reminded us that the privatizations of Air Canada and Petro Canada had been a bit of a disaster. But like the dude, we abided. On November 17, 1995, the government offered $2.25 billion worth of new CN shares. It was a big deal. Back then, a billion was real money. How'd it go? Well, let's just say the pundits were wrong. Just about everybody was wrong. More on this next week, because I love retelling this story. All right, we're back. Jenny, Scott, the hey. panel, how are hey. we today? Hey, hey. We are good. Scott, you are all exercised you are all exercised. Hang on, hang up. on. Is this about Zoom? Is this Tubin? Are you saying I'm exercised and I'm getting all worked up? <laughs> <laughs> so we know this technology Stop. has a bewitching effect on men our age, David. We don't know. Uh, Maybe this will bring more viewers as opposed to listeners to the pod. <laughs> I, not if I'm involved. But, uh, I, you know, there's something that hasn't been discussed about the Tubin thing. If you read the reports of it, I think he knew he'd been caught on camera. They all say, oh, caught unaware. He, But if you read it, they go into this breakout room thing with separate Zooms, and then he, like, you know, whatever. He, like, makes a parlor <laughs> treat of himself, and then, you know, he comes back, and he goes off. He goes off. To me, that's the tell. He goes off. He goes off camera. He shuts it down. Then he rejoins the Zoom, and it's like, hi, guys, just rejoining. He knew goddamn well that he'd been busted, and he was hoping he could fake his way through it. 
Who tries to fake? How do you fake your way through that? What do you mean exactly. fake your way through it? I think that's what he did. And his you panic, were I masturbating <laughs> in front of a Zoom call. There was twenty people on the call. On. Hi all. Um, so we regrouping uh, together, and they're like, "Gee, Jeff, yeah, where's he- your little pale friend?" Uh, <laughs> he was totally. He was totally trying to like pretend that. Like, let's hope that nobody saw that. Let's just hope that people would just give it a pass, because that's what folks will do, right? And uh, but he's anyway. over now. He's over. Yeah, he got what canceled. A stupid thing to end yourself on. Well, you know, this guy, you know, he has not had a glorious past either. So he's not exactly rolling in virtue. But, you know, like, there are a surprising number of people that are online. Masturbating on Zoom calls? No. Uh, I, <laughs> well, not to my knowledge. Um, but now that's what I'm going to figure everyone's doing. The minute I get on and someone clicks their camera off, I'm like, oh, my God, they're doing the dive down below, right? But, but it's, um, it's like politics. You know that he had so many enemies by how many rewrites of the story there was. Like, re- rewrite or like, like every two hours in the last 48 hours, there's been an update, to your point, Scott, about yeah. – uh, well, we then then we took a ten minute break, and uh, and then there was like breakout sessions, and and he left the room. Like to your point, like you know, you have no friends on that call when everybody <laughs> just comes to me and say, "I saw the guy whacking off." <laughs> Bingo. And he issues an apology. This is his response. I'm going to issue a statement of apology and regret. Thinking what? Like then, and then I'm going to like take a couple weeks and then I'll go back. No, that's not like, there's no statement of apology. You just go lay down in traffic and it's like, I'm fucking over. It's done. Just please. I'll hurl myself from the water tower. There's no coming back from this. And you know, I, you know, I'm small town Protestant and anything to do with sexual actions of any sort make me feel great shame and discomfort. But like, it's just, you can't come back from that. And all these people online going, you know, it's just masturbation and we all do it. We don't, no, we don't all do it on TV and stuff. It's no, it's no good. There's no coming back and there should be no coming back. I feel if we can, okay, well, our simulation, this line, it's, it's this, this conversation is just going to get worse and worse. All right. <laughs> That's right. Our simulations later in the podcast. So let's <laughs> yeah. this for, uh... keep your hands where we can see them, Harley. <laughs> um, Scott, you're all fucked up about Halloween. I see on Twitter. You're I'm all. Mad as hell. Uh... I'm mad as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore. And this is, and I'm going to. Jesus, this is your mad as hell. Th- t- like what? Two or three. Yep. Jenny, uh, Jenny is going to. Jenny's going to have great delight in this because I am <laughs> like. I'm going to sound like Jenny has on a number of occasions. And, you know, to me, this is a situation where um, without explanation, without elaboration, without exploration of the alternatives and the options, government just comes forward and says, you know what, Uh, uh, Halloween's got to be canceled. And I know people are going, oh, it's a big first world problem. Your kids can like watch a movie instead. No. Right. My kids have been thrust into this shitty school environment, notwithstanding the efforts of teachers and principals and everybody's making. And to be fair, everybody in the whole system, I presume, is trying hard to do the right thing. But, you know, five days into school, my kid gets hammered, COVID outbreak in the school, 14 days of isolation, comes back, gets told, nope, your school is changing again. Now your class teacher is, is going. You've got a new teacher. You're being combined into a room of 28 kids. That's all fine. But now on top of it, you can't have Halloween. And No explanation. And this is the kind of stuff where we don't know where the transmission is centered and where it's coming from because tracing has become ineffective. We have not given ourselves the infrastructure that we should have had for tracing. And now they say, therefore, without policy elements and explanation and why the alternatives are in inadvisable or or inadequate they just say look this has to be cancelled and I say fuck you and I think a lot of people are saying fuck you and demanding that they at least explain the antecedents of their policy choice walk me through it show me why the other things won't uh, work And, and, and it has got me angry and I think it's the kind of water cooler door by door parent by parent kind of issue that on top of the school stuff like they really risk You know, this Dr. Williams in Ontario, they really risk putting themselves in a situation where people withdraw their consent to defer and just go, you know what, sorry, Um, unless you are going to elaborate your reasoning more thoroughly, uh, I'm not sure I'm going to take your advice. And if that happens in the middle of a pandemic, you got a big problem. And so it's policies like this. Well, that's already happened. Well, I, no, I don't think it has happened. I think people by and large do defer, but they are testing people's limits here 
probably but starting with their failure on testing. And and I really think you watch the Halloween thing, and maybe I'm just too involved because I got young kids. But if I have to go and tell my seven-year-old that he's not going out for Halloween, someone is going to pay. That's the bottom line on a household-by-household -household basis. And the government had better get their heads around that or they're going to have a, a genuine management problem when it comes to guidance going forward. But Scott, do you think part of their problem yesterday, and I agree with you, I, what you have been saying, by the way, I've been saying since March, but... I, I, get, I get that. I recognize I, that. I agree that. I agree with you. Um, do you think it was made worse with with simultaneously making the decision to then allow dance studios to open? Well, it's, I, I mean, it's insane. I'm going to stuff your kid in a room with 29 other children. I'm going to open up dance studios. And by God, Lisa McLeod's on Twitter going, you know, this is a cause that I've been rallied to and I'm there for you. And then they say, now we're going to cancel Halloween. You're like, could you people get in a fucking room and talk like these things through? Because there is no sensibility. And it reveals that, um, that apparently at least, to be fair, apparently there is not an underlying reasoning. There's not an underlying logic that is that holds together and is co coherent. The best argument I've heard is that it's impossible to manage tracing should there be challenges after Halloween. I think, okay, that's not a bad argument. I hate it. Like I wouldn't like the Paul, but it, if that's presented to me and I'm persuaded that it can't be well managed, that might be the kind of argument where I would go, all right, well, I guess I got to knuckle under. Well, but just standing Scott, up and saying I, dance studios, yes, Halloween, no. Like, and, and, and Scott, I, I listened to you this morning on, uh, on 1010, and uh, uh, Robert Benzi actually had the best, uh, the best defense of the government policy by talking about it's yeah. not just you know, people going house to house in, in, higher, in, in neighborhoods. There are certain Ontario neighborhoods in uh, uh, at kind of the suburbs of the uh, 416 in Rexdale and Scarborough where uh, trick-or-treat would be 100% inside. So if your kids are doing the traditional knock on doors, they're doing it in in the building that you uh, you live in, and I felt that was the most. I, I still disagreed with it, but it was the most coherent defense of the policy that I have heard in the last twenty four hours. By a mile, they should when hire I was him. a kid in Regina, when I was a kid in Regina, the two high rise buildings in the city used to be the prized places to go uh, uh, trick or treating because what they would do is they'd have a a big pot for the whole high rise just down in the lobby. Woo. And uh, so everybody in the whole high rise would kick in and then they'd have, so you'd get this massive haul when you went to, as I say, one of the two high rises. Well, in, look at you, uh, you, you with your fancy, you with your fancy high rises, there wasn't anything more than two stories in Fenland when I was growing up. And, <laughs> yeah. and to be but fair, Scott, there still isn't. <laughs> same for me Scott, in rural Ontario, but we would go into the city occasionally once I got a little bit older when I was like 11 and we'd go into the city and then you would hit a couple of those apartment buildings, not because they had the big barrel, that's a wonderful idea, but because you go door to door in three feet, bang, bang, efficient, man. Like you're just scoring, scoring, scoring. The UNICEF box was like overflowing, man. I was a genius. UNICEF box. What kind of nerd were you? What about your pillowcase? Oh, you I carried two. Yeah. I carried two UNICEF boxes. And I had a spooky bag. I didn't have a pillowcase. Oh I had a spooky bag that when you put it together, it would make a sound. When you put the like, handles together, it would click and then it would go, woo. That was terrifying. Oh, really? No. I was a pure pillowcase guy. Biggest thing you could get. But aren't you full of shit, Scott? Yeah. I mean, it's fucking Halloween, right? I mean, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Of all the things. Right. I mean, surely the kids, it's not, I mean, of all the things to give up, I mean, we are, we're experiencing serious pandemic fatigue now. I think that, I think the distrust of governments is in well in train on this stuff. And I think people's willingness to do things is diminishing all the time. And, you know, Keith and, uh, and Neil were just uh, on the podcast talking about how back in March, they were checking the data every day, maybe every hour on what the cases were. And now they kind of wait for somebody to tell them whether something's happened. I mean, I, I, we, I, I'm, not I'm sure pretty I sure we're going to end up, I'm pretty sure we're going to end up with herd immunity by stealth. Um, I don't ultimately. think, well, first of all, I don't think there is, I, I, herd immunity is not a strategy. It's a, it, it's a surrender, but, um, and uh, there'll be a lot of, um, there'll be a lot of successful funeral home directors by the time we get through with that. But I, I mean, I, I think people follow masking. I think people follow the rules by and large. So, you know, we may be paying more uh, less attention. We may be getting more routinized. But the combination of the schools, like, and, and I take your point, David, and I know I sound like, you know, suddenly I've gone over to the anti-masker side. I haven't. 
I mean, literally, if they explain it and they walk it through and they can demonstrate the reasoning, then I'll surrender on this point. But they haven't done that. They haven't even attempted to do that. They're saying, just take it on fiat that this is what it has to be. But, and this is one of those things where I think it could be it could be a water cooler issue that sets people off on the balance of it. I agree with you, Scott, and I want you to finish your point. But I want to point out, like, there's a section of people, it's not, uh, you know, you support all the COVID measures that... Uh, all of the uh, new rock star doctors have been putting in place for us. Uh, and you're anti-masker. There are people like me. I wear a mask when I go out. I don't like, I don't fight about it. I wear a mask. If it's something I have to do to be able to go into stores and restaurants, I like that idea, although I can't go into restaurants now. So there is this segment of the population that is it, it isn't as easy to say, oh, they're anti-maskers and they're not for anything. There are people though that are just for, okay, Doctors have been telling us how to live our lives for six months and not once have they justified it. And my, this was my issue, Scott, when uh, when we used to have these debates in April or May is they were making lockdown decisions, the same as what they did this week on Halloween, with absolutely no justification as to why they were doing it. And so I was more indulgent of it then because we were handling something new and they were having to exercise the precautionary principle. Now, they should have been able to resource tra tracing and testing to an effective enough degree that they could base policy making around those results. But because they dropped the goddamn ball on that, they're not able to do that. So I, I don't disagree with you. And I'm not suggesting that um, there's only those two extremes in terms of reaction to it. What I'm saying is I feel a little... I feel a little sheepish saying, look, I haven't become like some kind of anti-vaxxer, anti-masker sort of person. That's not where I'm at. I, I, but to me, this has been my window as a parent. Like, again, I go through it. I have to spend 45 minutes a morning getting my seven-year-old convinced to go into the schoolyard. He hates going to school right now. It's a shitty experience. Right? Like, I'm literally kidding. I'm not kidding. Like, the, he, you know, it's tough. And I'm not the only parent going through that. Then their classes get reconstituted. Then there's a COVID outbreak and they have to come back and go online for a handful of days. Then they cancel the online registration for November. Then they say that the testing and tracing process in the, in the midst of Toronto has gone down because there's insufficient resources. So we don't really know what the transmission trends are. Then they say cancel Halloween. And I go, all right, this is the straw that broke this camel's back. I'm sure that other straws are breaking other backs, but there's a lot of parents and I just think they better watch where they're at in terms of measuring public uh, sentiment because it's this kind of thing that can take off on you politically. It's the inconsistency that kills you too. Right? I mean, like that dance studio thing on the same day was just criminally stupid, not from a partisan perspective, from a public crisis communications perspective was absolutely Terrible. It's like saying we're going to raise your taxes on the same day that you're announcing uh, a subsidy for bank presidents. It just makes no sense, right? Like you go, right. well, these policies are in direct contradiction. At the same time yeah. that we say all this and all that, there are as many cases in North Dakota, population 500,000, as there are in Ontario on a daily basis. So yeah. if you don't do this stuff, <laughs> so, you can end up like that. Like Saskatchewan has 80 cases, and it's the biggest outbreak they've had. There are a million people sitting right north of North Dakota, which had seven or 800 cases yesterday. Yeah, but that's what... But that's but the, a lot of the American states have made the determination. Now this goes into other studies that have come out, uh, especially in the last uh, in the last week. And there was a, a poll in the Globe and Mail. Uh, I'm not sure who did it uh, that talked about 25 percent of Canadians are saying they feel worse uh, in a mental health aspect now than what they did uh, in the spring. And and I can understand that, Scott. You're talking about your ki your kids hating to go to school. What seven year old hates to go to school? That was when you used to, you know, uh, be happy. And I think it's 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 terrible. I talked to other friends that have uh, kids in the same situation, and so these are the governments who have uh, Canada. Uh, there was a part of the poll was that basically Canadians feel less hopeful for like the next six months because I think. At least in March and April, we were expecting spring. You, st you still were getting snow where, where you are, David, but we were expecting spring and summer. It's the complete opposite now. So what we're looking forward to in, in October and early November, we know what we're getting for the most part of where you're living in Canada uh, for uh, January, February, uh, March. And Americans are more hopeful. And it might just be the tone that governments are taking. And I'm not trying to get, this is not a Trump, anti-Trump, 
uh, type thing, but it's, it, there is a different sense. It seems in terms of, um, uh, watching the American, uh, media outside of California and New York, uh, than what we have here. And that might be part of the, the issue that we're having in terms of, uh, dealing with it and why politicians and public health care officials think they can come out and say, well, we're canceling Halloween because we have the right to do that. And, uh, you know, John Tory even stepped in it yesterday because he and his he and his officials said that they might actually uh, find kids who were actually going at trick or treating, thinking that this was something that he probably had the authority to do. And then it turns out that this is actually just advice and it's not a bylaw. So even the city of Toronto can't try to make money off of finding trick or treaters. So anyways, that's my rant to say, I think it's, it's now how people are just determining how they're going to get through the next desolate yeah. seeming six I, months. I, 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 I guess I know I, I'll be accused of trying to have it always, but from my perspective, it's actually more about, um, it really is more about the point of if you're going to have to pursue unpopular policies as a, as governments, you have to recognize that asking people to make sacrifice requires certain things of you as, as government if you wish to maintain your authority and to continue to invoke that authority and be listened to. One, you have to explain your reasoning. Two, that reasoning has to be policy rooted in some way, shape or form. Three, very importantly, to your point about consistency, David, that it has to meet a test of fairness. You know, uh, like, you know, you have to go through those steps um, and 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 they haven't been done. Uh, in, Surely on that this happens specific at the command position. table. But they haven't. But, but Surely stop, that happens been... at the command table. <laughs> no, but I'm just saying if, <laughs> if government does that, table. it will carry more people with them, I believe. And when it stands but up and says. But they haven't done it for seven months. You've, you've defended. Sometimes you've, this they is have. Literally, no, this is. You have literally defended the decision making of governments for seven months. That's how long we've been in this. It's what October. Well, see, this is why October. I want to have it both ways. Cause I, I don't believe that I haven't, I've always said that I thought that they blew the summer. They blew the summer because they did not prepare carefully enough by hiring more teachers, expanding physical infrastructure of schools, getting ready for what we knew. They blew it by not providing enough resources for the flu vaccine, which we're in danger of running out of in a couple of weeks. And then we're going to have a whole other clusterfuck. They didn't prepare by providing the resources necessary to do t proper testing and tracing. And that's why it's getting suspended in the city of Toronto. And, and the feds and the feds have not approved rapid testing, which they should have been doing. Over well, the they did approve months. rapid testing, to be no, fair, no, but they, they were didn't. too slow to do no, no, it no, i they agree were with slow. you no 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 they, they they were drag kicking and screaming so don't it's it's not just provincial governments like if we're going to talk about in action uh, on governments it's it's yeah. it's it's across the uh uh it's across the board uh, fair enough although i do think the feds have gotten it more right than wrong and others have been more episodic but i you know when it comes okay to well maybe Dakota, that's maybe that's not, sorry maybe, maybe that leads right into our next subject all right maybe that because because we, we could have a federal there election. we go holy Holy Christmas. Oh, we could have Holy Christmas to the Liberals want an election. Like they basically sent Pablo Rodriguez out to basically carry the water to why these guys want an election. To which I say, I'm bragging again, not so humble of a brag. I called they wanted to have an election months ago. Uh, but Rodriguez's it's Rodriguez's messaging is one hundred percent a party uh, that, that 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 wants one. Our wow. government That's well, interesting. I have a completely different take. So maybe I'm well, not just stupid, liberal, maybe I'm not. I love the liberal strategy because I don't think anybody wants to face them on the hustings right now. And I like the fact that they, uh, I like the fact that they put that right on the table. That's how you manage well, a minority it's, party. No, it's you didn't, leverage didn't, your political credibility on the street they, into the House of Commons. That's what you Well, and, and I'm not sure it's going to work because let's be honest, they actually don't, they, they don't really actually have a pretty good and a good argument on this in terms of uh, we're going to go because we don't want to... Uh, uh, talk about the sins of our our people, basically, which we can get we can get into. Um, if they were a decisive government, they would have made the decision a month ago to go. So this is a government that continues to like uh, kind of whip in the wind, so to speak, uh, uh, in terms of making their uh, in terms of making their decision. But I think we're all on the same page that this is they are they are watching. They're they have basically now watched John Horgan and their and 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 Scott Moe get reelected with basically bigger majorities. Moe is already there, but Horgan's actually gonna end and up Higgs. in a majority position. And Higgs. And Higgs and Higgs. Higgs. I I don't think that had a lot page. to do with Kevin Vickers, but don't get me started on that guy oh, again. God, wow. Yeah, I don't uh, think they want I don't think they want an election. I don't think they want either. an election. I think they're prepared for an election. You don't think um, they want it. You don't no. think they want to go by. You don't think they want to go by the uh, 
uh, the spring though? Well, I don't know when they might want to go. I, I I think that's a watching brief. I don't think this is about trying to actually produce an election. So but I, I think this I, is I about. I think what they don't want is to go through another six months of hemorrhaging political support on scandal investigations of a committee that is specially set up to investigate scandals and potential scandals. And so they would probably be of the view that they would rather have an election now than have that go on. That this I believe. Goes- but this goes to bad decision making, because if you're the liberals and you're you're playing this out, having, having someone that uh, worked through many of uh, uh, a committee challenge uh, in government uh, when I was uh, I was working for Harper. Uh, at the end of the day, you would have made the determination. It would have been better to have the finance committee looking into we because I doubt there's probably more than um, uh, than we already know. But that being said, I'm intrigued because every day that there is just a little bit more, like the fact that the Trudeau family made a lot more money than we initially said in in uh, in July. So there's enough there that it keeps it salacious. I'm not sure it's enough there uh, to actually take a dent at them in the polls. And frankly, as the uh, COVID response turns more economic, which we have talked about several times in the last uh, six months, having your uh, having your finance committee wrapped up potentially in like some kind of scandal, which the liberals have determined, obviously, who knows, depending on the day, whether they think it's, it's bad or not, almost seems better than opening the kimono, so to speak, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of how Canada has. Canada has a lack of plan of actually getting us out of our, you know, trillion dollar net debt. So when I watch, but surely, uh, surely, uh, hang on, Dave. I want to say, I, I, I want right, I, I really want to f- fuck the weed committee for a minute. Here's what I really think this is all about. And and when I watch this, when I look at this situation, when I look at Pablo Rodriguez say, you know what, we're going to make it a confidence vote. Let's rumble. Then the immediate reaction I have is envy and self recrimination. That's what I think, because it takes me right back to 2004 when we were in a minority parliament and we did not have the ability to do what they're doing today. We did not have the strength. We didn't have the hand to play it like this. We were too weak a minority to say, if you guys want to fucking go, then let's go. But what you're not going to do, you're not going to use the minority status of this parliament to control committees, to turn a committee into something that's bigger than just a committee and to use it to maintain and control the agenda of political news in this country day by day by day by day. And that's what's at stake. And it might be about we, it might be about other things. But if I'm the government, I'm going, sorry, I've got to be able to keep my hand on the rudder. And yeah, I'm going to have to go through some ugly moves in order to get that control, but they are strong enough that they can exert the control and stare the opposition but down. Sometimes, sometimes we weren't, you guys and it really but, bothers me when no, but, I'm looking but, at this and I'm reminded of the fact that we weren't strong enough to play it that way. No, but way, you, guys ultimately, you guys ultimately did. If if we could go back there, sometimes you make decisions to stay in the game if, uh, that end up uh, backfiring. And I would say uh, when you guys had Belinda cross the floor, uh, I, I remember being a junior staffer in the war room and being so depressed uh, that you guys were able to win that vote with her and then Chuck Cadman. At the end of the day, though, if we, if you guys had fallen that day, you would have probably come back with a bigger minority, yeah. probably possibly a majority, and we would have had no chance to win the election unlike where the position we were at back in six months. So these are, there's a lot of uh, decision-making yes. and and uh, reflection that governments have to do in terms of and, uh, when is good and when is not. David can correct me, but we knew that. But Paul, the prime minister, did not want um, to roll the dice on an election in that environment because he was worried about the deterioration we would have in the province of Quebec because of the sponsorship scandal. And he was very anxious about uh, putting uh, new wind into the sails of of um, of the separatist movement and you always say to yourself in a moment like this i'll probably if i push it forward i'll probably still maintain my optionality which of course turns out not to be true but i just i look at the situation we had waged here's here's what i remember here's what i remember is that we were in a weak position and we were facing that vote and we waged a very effective campaign against the need for an election and in favor of moving forward with our policy agenda, that was so effective that by the time the vote came, Jenny's right. We should have had an election, yes. but our own actions had 
eliminated that prospect. We could not have then engineered our own defeat. But David, do you not? I know we're going down a rabbit hole. Sorry, Jenny, but David, no, no, do you Quebec, not, you're no, right about no, Paul and Quebec. Do, do you not? Right uh, yes, Paul but Quebec. also I recall meeting at 24 Sussex one night, and it was after the threat of an election had been put on the table, after the threat of a defeat in the Commons had been put on the table, and we said, okay, we're going to have Paul do a national address. He's going to talk. This is the, the fact, night when I spilled my Caesar on the couch, is it? <laughs> it may be, but the thing I remember about what you said, which turned out to be prophetic, even to this moment and this very moment in this podcast, you said at that time, Prime Minister, if we execute this strategy of public persuasion effectively, by the time we get to the vote, we'll regret it because we'll have wished that we lose the vote. And that's exactly what happened, even to the point where Jenny is now reminding us that, you know, we should have lost the vote. It would have been better for us. My point simply is, we had lost the ability, by and large, we had lost much, of, despite our success in making that case, we were really hanging on by tiny threads in terms of our ability to manage parliament and to maintain control of the political agenda. And and I think, um, and that was one of the things I regretted on a day-by-day -day basis. We didn't feel like we were in control of the agenda and it bothered the hell out of me as someone that would want to be in control of the agenda. And I think this move is all about saying to the conservative, saying to Pierre Polyev, Thank you for I'm bringing sorry, this back you're to not going politics. to fucking take control of the agenda and use this corruption super committee to dictate the daily news cycle. We're not going to do it. We'd rather have an election and we'll win the goddamn thing if we have to. Of course they would. Like so surely the conservatives course, are going to turtle now. Surely the conservatives would, are going to turtle. Of course they would win the election if there was one held now. No, I don't think anyone's disputed that. They will never get better. Uh, they will never get better. Uh, uh, factors for them to have an election. So to say they're like turning it against the conservatives, like if I was the conservatives now, I'd be like, they're saying what they have to be saying, but nobody, why would anyone in that party want an election? You, you actually, they need another six months for people to be thinking about something other than COVID for people like you who have been obsessed for with COVID for the last six months to actually be more upset about Halloween than the government's handling of like billions and billions of fucking dollars. Oh, well, I'm that still voting what, liberal. <laughs> But if you if you look at, of course you are. Um, but if you look at uh, uh, the polling, and David, I know you follow this a lot more than me. The only party that's actually up nationally overall are the Liberals, and they're up by about what four points over the last election, which puts them under this Parliament in a majority. So you've got the Conservatives are at exactly the same place they are. Uh, Singh is down about three points in the last poll that I saw. I think it was a Lege poll. Uh, and the Greens are pretty much, the Greens and the Bloc are holding their own. So the only thing that changes uh, if there's an election, seemingly, if you believe the national polls, is that the Liberals are going to take some seats back from the Conservatives. So how do the Conservatives play their cards in the next few days then, Jenny? Like, I mean, because... I don't, it, think, I don't think they can. I don't think they can change. I If... if you believe the Liberals don't want an election, uh, then then that's something we can disagree on. I think we can all agree on a party that does not want an election is the NDP. So the they Conservatives have, will just relate, rely on the NDP to back down and, 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 and it's sustain possible. the cause. Uh, it's possible, but I don't think the Conservatives can change for the same political reasons Neither. that you guys couldn't Agreed. change the flow of, of the 2005 uh, Belinda Stronach, Chuck Cadman vote. Uh, the conservatives can't change the uh, uh, the way they're handling this. Jesus Christ! But my guess all this talk makes me want to grab a my guess go to the liquor the cabinet right now. Fuck. PDF. I'm going I'm to I'm I'm use a I'm going to use a Scott Reed expression because I always like it. The NDP on this issue, they don't seem to know whether to shit or wind their watch. Eh? <laughs> they. Uh... <laughs> True enough. <laughs> They got Charlie Angus out there running his mouth about this issue, and then there's official party stuff just undercuts him all the time. There's well, more, yeah, more I, winding I, of the there's watch. An there's an obvious disconnect, like not to get into like internal ND, into the weeds for the NDP, but if you watch it, it looks like a leader's office that doesn't talk to any of their caucus. It's like the early days of Trudeau, like where, you know, uh, the joke was Trudeau didn't know any of his of his uh, caucus names. That's ultimately what you see with with Singh. See, he is just less names to remember. I agree with that, but there is something to be said for the for the crushing circumstance that is um, being on the spot in a minority parliament when you don't really have any options. So you have an instinct to talk big like you have options, but then you can't really back that up. So you try to give yourself wiggle room, but everyone knows you're trying to create wiggle room, so they're pinning you back on it, and you just look contradictory and weak and flail all over the place. But you don't look like wiggle room. Like It's not like uh, uh, Singh has got the... 
you know, the negotiation prowess of, of, of what Jack Layton was towards the end of his career. Like Singh will literally go out in the media and say, I will give the liberals this and then basically go meet Trudeau, give him exactly what he wants and then go out and talk about how like he's, it's a win and nobody's buying it anymore. He no. just doesn't, he's not as good a communicator. He, he obviously doesn't compel uh, his party. And so at the end of the day, uh, if the liberals truly don't want an election, the NDP might, um, uh, NDP might save them. And maybe the liberals are still waiting. If they're still, they're going to see uh, like these by-elections in Toronto. I don't know what you guys are, are hearing, but I'm hearing that, well, Toronto center absolutely would be uh, um, um, an absolute win for them. Um, but I'm hearing they're doing really well in York Center and York Center federally for the conservatives. I think I've said this on the pod before should be one of our, our, uh, our best ridings. And, and, uh, I don't see much, uh, pickup for the conservative candidate, uh, unfortunately. But to be fair, the machine of the conservative party signaled early that they were bailing on that. And so they were saying, please don't use it as a measuring stick on us. We're not putting up a serious candidate. We're not going to dedicate smart. resources. And that's the best you can do in a situation like that. I, I just, you know, the one yeah, other once, thing. Once, 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 once Jenny's candidate, Melissa Lastman, wouldn't run, the Conservatives abandoned that writing. I was all for <laughs> Melissa running. Uh, but that's, that's, I'd like to see Melissa, my friend, do well. I don't want to see Melissa, the Conservative, do well. I was, I would, I'd be, I would have been, we'd be doing this from like the hustings. I'd be knocking on doors. Uh, I'd be knocking on doors right now for Melissa. Hey, the other uh, big event in Canada going on right now is in Nova Scotia. And that is the lobster fishery issue. Um, with the commercial fishery and the uh, and the Micmac, I do not understand. I do not understand how a government that continues to say that reconciliation with Indigenous people is its number one priority, and will sit back and have their have their national police force sit by while uh, vigilante mobs are. Uh, are burning uh, and uh, in other in other ways vandalizing uh, indigenous uh, lobster fishing equipment. This seems like a bizarre fucking situation, and the federal government's response seems really bizarre to it. You mean the the leadership of of simply just saying that you want it like a uh, an emergency committee hearing uh, a committee of the whole uh, in meeting on parliament last night? Yeah, you night? have the minister calling for a debate. The minister yes. calling for a debate. You don't need a fucking debate. You need action. She, it was, and not just that, her, Trudeau and her led the debate off. Like, you get, yep. it gets to the point, like, I, rem, I remember back in about 2000, leading into the 2011 election, and finally, like, us coming to the conclusion, we can't blame the sins on the government, on the former government anymore. Sure, there's certain things we can do because ultimately it was it was you guys that brought Omar Khadr to Gitmo and what have you. There's certain things that we could uh, uh, we could uh, we could point you out. You guys are of, still doing mailings on fucking Omar Khadr. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't get me. Anyways, that's a pod for another day. Um, and so, um, but at the end of the day, it was your decision. So there's governments that can't, this is the, this government has had over five years now to, uh, uh, David, to your point, to deal with issues and um, they have not done it. And they seemingly have ignored this issue. It's been brewing for months now. If you remember, there were me there would be media reports, not the daily reports that, that kind of lead off the news now, but it's one of those things that if you check the Atlantic press or if you follow any of the publications, even CBC Atlantic on, on, on Twitter, we were seeing stories of uh, problems between the commercial fishery and the uh, and the Micmac. So this should, this should not have been a surprise. We're kind of like, like the government's acting like they're surprised over this, but this has been brewing, well, for years, but this specific issue has been brewing for months. I'm also critical. Um, I, I think uh, for the reasons you guys have said, but I think there's a couple things. I think there's a confluence of a couple factors that, um, uh, that, uh, that result in the apparent inaction or the sense of inaction that we're uh, witnessing. So uh, at the federal level, uh, one is, I do think the government is vulnerable to the criticism that it is uh, very strong on symbolic leadership around indigenous issues and has been less effective when it comes to executing on the ground. Um, now, some of that is a little bit unfair too, because a lot has been done when it comes to the bread and butter stuff on water and all that kind of stuff uh, on reserves. But on an issue like this, 
um, I think one, it 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 somewhat illuminates the government's um, impulse that it oh well, but we don't want to like we, we want to have a debate, not to have, have have an action. The second thing, which I think is has been somewhat overlooked, is the fact that Stephen McNeil is a liberal premier, and I think the government has felt. Uh, a little bit paralyzed by that. I think that um, they've been listening. McNeil's like, be careful. Like, McNeil didn't sound the alarm early and say, bring in the troops, do the following four things. That dialogue has only started to happen in still relatively muted terms in the last few days. I, I think that the federal government probably should have been on the phone. Maybe they were, and we just don't know it. And saying to McNeil, you know what? Just for Christ's sake, send us a request. Send us a request for action. Send us a request for uh, cops. Send us a request uh, for resources, and we will grant it gladly. Because I think that what McNeil's been trying to do is balance, you know, um, a, a, a commercial fishery that feels beleaguered and is anxious about, you know, uh, the indigenous fishery that's that's maintaining its activity, and then you get all those kind of collisions. And anybody that it's easy to be all for indigenous rights when you live a million miles away from it. But when you're one mile from uh, uh, from the site of indigenous activity, and you go, okay, well now, right? These guys are fishing; these guys can't. And some 31 year old takes it way too far, starts burning stuff. At that point, it's a law and order issue. You just got to say, sorry, it think- can't happen. But McNeil's been trying to juggle these constituencies, it seems to me. And I think the federal government should have been saying, listen, dude, like, it's kind of like the scene in Godfather 2, right? If you don't take care of this, I will have to. And we are going to be coming in here and dealing with this situation and establishing law and order and making certain that the treaty rights of the indigenous are recognized and respect it. Like, we just will. Like, it's because it's just a matter of law and order. But do you think part of McNeil's problem in terms of dealing on the law and order stuff is, my guess is there's been a complete breakdown of, of the Premier's office relationship with the RCMP. Because, of course, in Nova Scotia and, you oh, know, Ontario and Quebec, we're in, yeah. we're in, we're in a much different position because we got provincial police forces. So you've now had basically a government and an RCMP that uh, uh, Nova Scotia detachment that have been in um, uh, that have been under fire basically since uh, uh, since last April uh, in the mass shooting. And so my guess, and you guys have sat in government. My guess is is that because of the nature of the investigation and everyone kind of pointing fingers, uh, there is probably no relationship between these uh, two organizations or not a very good one, which has probably affected his ability to manage the situation. That's, that's a really good not point. Not defending it, but just... No, that's, that, that's a, probably a really good, important piece of real world context. And it's, and the, the comments from the RCMP post about, you know, kind of this kind of, uh, well, you know, we got to manage both sides sort of thing. This isn't really a police matter. Like, no. That's an inadequate response, man. And sorry, like someone needs to rattle that cage. And, you know, you can't just have politicians banging into the RCMP's business. But at the same time, there has to be accountability uh, for the failure to maintain law and order. Yeah, despite your love for Marvel and DC Comics, you do not support vigilante justice, right? No, I do not. I do not. And, I think, <laughs> and that's where it starts, right? Like, I mean, we can talk about comics, but it starts there. Like, it starts there. It's like, sorry, guys, at the point where, pe- where chiefs are getting punched out in the, uh, in the streets and, uh, and, and buildings are getting burned, you say, all right, um, foot comes down, enough is enough, law and order will be respected. And it's taken too long to get to that point. All right, kids, we only got a few minutes left. Trump, (laughs) what's left to happen down there? There's two weeks left. There's two weeks left. Neil and and Keith were quite confident that Biden would win the election. They were very unconfident about what would happen in the streets of the United States after that and anticipated some uh, anticipated violence, frankly, uh, after it's all over. But are, do any of you see any evidence of tightening here or any evidence that this race is getting a little closer as we head toward the finish? Well, and I'm sure we'll talk about this leading into the next two weeks. Um, I think that there are going to be people rallying in the streets uh, unhappy regardless of who wins uh, uh, as president. It's it's a deeply, it seems seemingly a deeply divided com- uh, country. Tr- Trump's probably going to get 
still in the in the neighborhood of 60 to 65 million votes. That's still a lot of support, even if he uh, he, he doesn't okay. win and, and vice versa. That's original around what Biden will get, if not more Hillary got more than uh, Trump in the last uh, in the last election. Um, uh, but it depends on what you believe in the polls. Like this is exact. like these conversations are remind me ex- like really leading up to the t- 2016 campaign where everyone was like absolutely certain that Hillary was uh, uh, was winning this. And if you actually look, Frank Luntz, uh, a, a Republican pollster from um, uh, from the states, um, he had a full like comparison of like the state by state polls. Um, I, and they're pretty much except for like states like Wisconsin that have the Democrats higher than what they had Hillary at this point in the 2016 campaign. They're pretty much like bang on. And depending on what you uh, what you look at in terms of like social media and commentary uh, is you have Republicans out spinning. Well, this is good news because. Uh, our 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 uh, strategy has always been get out the vote, and our voters are more mobilized. And you have the exact same spin coming from the Democrats. So it's it's it will be an interesting kind of two weeks to uh, uh, to watch. And there is more and more stories, which I'm sure we'll get into in the next uh, couple of weeks about um, uh, problems with the mail in uh, the mail in ballot um, uh, mail in ballots uh, in different. Jenny, if you had districts. to guess, if you had to guess, Jenny. Do you think that Trump is more motivating to his base or to uh, the Democratic base? I still think he's more motivating for his base. Yeah, I, you know I, how I think hard the exact it is. opposite. No, but you know how hard. OK, I can say like as someone that's run campaigns and, and we could have a debate on this. It has always been much harder to mobilize someone to go out and vote for something that they are against or they don't support. Like the reason you can get people out to the polls is they're supporting, whether it's generally supporting a party or it's in that by-election when you're pulling out the last 300 votes because, you know, Bob's neighbor uh, has known Bob for 20 years and has go out and support him. Like it's, I, st- I think it, 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 regardless of how much people hate Trump, um, I think that he still is more motivating for uh, Republicans and Trump supporters. I don't, I don't believe that personally. Um, and I think that, there's more evidence uh, to support my assertion, and we'll know. Two weeks today, I think that orange stain is going to get scrubbed out of the White House, and I think it's going to be an overwhelming um, uh, result. And I, 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 I'm i not sure about months, but I can tell you, I've been watching the polls very carefully and going state by state. And in Wisconsin, um, even in Florida, in Michigan, there are like all those places that were close and were closer than they should have been uh, last time. Those places have moved heavily in the past two weeks and decisively, um, you know, instead of margins of two and three percent, they're six, seven percent, sometimes um, more. In Florida, I think clearly the, uh, the Democrats are in command. And I just think you go state by state, state by state. Yeah, the national polls don't matter that much, although they get to matter at a point when it's like double digits. When it's double digits leads, the math doesn't work that. Like it can't be that that result is not reflective of something happening at the state level, right? So, But, she I was think in, but Hillary was in double digit leads this time leading. No, not really. End. By the end, she wasn't in double digits lead. It was right, right two toward- Two weeks before? Well, two she weeks before Comey- Two weeks before and then Comey hit, like literally two weeks before and then Comey hit. So if you you have to look at that that period, I think, uh, and if Comey hadn't hit, then you might have had the same result that we're looking at right now. But I, I, I really think that Biden is widening his lead and, and in control of the situation. And I think all of this matters because I think you need, to the point that Neil and, and Keith were making, I think you need a decisive margin on election night in order to avoid... Uh, weird shit. Like if there's a decisive margin, then all of these things we're talking about, mail and votes and all that stuff, that'll all just be face saving, face saving bullshit talking points on the way out the door that Trump will use to try to justify to himself and his followers for the rest of his life that it that he didn't lose, it got stolen from. Fine. Tell yourself whatever the fuck you want as long as you're gone. But if it's if it's not decisive, then you do end up in a world where it gets it gets hairy. Maybe Trump sends out all sorts of contradictory signals, you know, and then you get like, you know, the Proud Boys and everybody taking up arms. I just, I personally am both hopeful that that won't be the 
the outcome. And I don't think it's going to be the outcome. I think it's going to be decisive enough that that stuff won't happen. And I think Trump at this point, and I think since 2018, Keith made the point since 2017, perhaps in Virginia, has been clearly more animating of his opposition than he is of his own supporters. And I say good riddance to the orange fuck. I hope he rots and goes. And my hope for him is not just that he loses, but that he loses and he squanders around. And there's a big fight in the Republican Party for six months about who was uh, Vichy and who wasn't. And then there's all kinds of disgrace. And then they slap. They slap the handcuffs on the prick and he spends the rest of his life in prison. That's what I want to see. I want to see him in the box. I want to see him standing in the box getting charged. That's where Donald Trump should end his life. Wow, I, I, I always love. Hate him. I always, I always love these uh, uh, conversations so much. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's the most corrosive thing in American and world politics in decades. He's worse than Nixon, okay. and that's saying something. So, Jenny. Okay, so magically, Trump agrees to listen to the advice he's given, and magically, you are put in. Is it Bill Stepien who's currently running that campaign, or what? I, I think. You're I put think in, let's see if he lasts the next two weeks. That poor bastard, gum right. on the shoe. You're put in place <laughs> as the campaign manager. What could Trump do in the debate? The last gonna debate the that's thing. coming up. He's going to do the same thing. He's going to try to no, make. No, but what could he uh, do? What could he? Well, do no, he, but, that would. Okay, but okay, but you're asking so. So there's really like if there's two weeks left. So they're going to try to make Biden look old and weak, which we've talked about is his biggest uh, downfall because he is old and seemingly weak. We have we've talked on this pod about how Democrats just hope he basically survives for six months after this campaign. So like that, like so it's not so. So if if you're going to go after if you're a camp, if you're a campaign now, the best thing to go after is where there's truth. And Biden seems old and weak. And so that, I think, is where uh, Trump is going to go and probably what they spend their, um, their, resources, uh, their resources doing. But you've seen Trump. He's, he's reverted back to uh, the build the wall stuff. He, was, uh, he spent the clip that his own campaign pushed out yesterday was uh, him going after uh, CNN. He called them bastards. His, the people that are motivated by Trump agree that CNN are a bunch of bastards. So you, I think you're just going to see more of it for the same. And they're going to focus on... Uh, they're going to focus in states like Arizona and Georgia on uh, on the ground game, so to speak, and uh, work on getting those uh, those voters out. By the way, I bet you Trump loses Georgia, which uh, um, I know is going to sound astonishing, but I bet you he does lose Georgia. Um, it, it's it's possible. It's possible. I'm just saying what his campaign yeah. should be doing for the next two weeks. I hear you. that was just. Can I? I'll just add one thought to this. The other day, on some American commentator said something that I. That perfectly captured what I think um, and hadn't been able to crystallize in words. And the point the person made was that in 2016, Trump was every bit as crazy as he is now. But in 2016, not only was he crazy, not only did he spend every moment of air time uh, soliciting, um, uh, soliciting grievances, but that in 2016, the grievances that he, were sol he was soliciting were the grievances of the public. Right. It was anxiety about immigration. It was anxiety about economic uh, opportunity. It was anxiety about manufacturing and and um, outsourcing of jobs. And in 2020, all of the grievances that he's soliciting is he's every bit as crazy and every bit as voluble. But the grievances that he's soliciting are all his own. He just bitches and moans about shit that bugs Trump and it doesn't connect and register with people. It's not about them. It's about him. And and that's like because his behavior is so similar, we think it's the same thing, but it isn't because he's not talking about something that they give a fuck about unless they just by extension care about him. But bitching about CNN in the absence of bitching about building the wall, like that's not a message. That's not going to close the deal with voters. And so I, I, I thought that was a really important insight. And I, I so if I was going to do something for Trump in, in the next debate, in the next two weeks, it would be to get Steve Bannon on the phone, as much as I think he's the architect of evil, and say, let's recapture that message track. Do your best to close the deal. It's probably too late, but spend the next two weeks at least having a message that's loud and angry and offensive 
but at least is connecting with the voters that he cares about, about something they care about, not just what obsesses Trump. Because that's a fucking, that's, that's just ego. That's just, that's Jeffrey Tubin, man. That's just jerking off. <laughs> well, there's a perfect circle. I look forward to what's happening with you two. Pun intended. <laughs> I look forward to what's happening with you two on Thursday night during the debate and seeing what's going on. And I look forward to chatting with you about it next Tuesday. Thanks for coming on. It's great to see both of you. You're brightening my COVID depression. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.